<laughs> All right. Well, um, we've just uh, viewed La Ciudad, and I'm in here in the Hoboken Historical Museum. I'm Rand Hoppy, and I'm so uh, thankful and, and happy to, to welcome um, writer, director, producer David Riker, who, who made that movie. And uh, he, he really wanted to be here in person to see Hoboken and how Hoboken has changed. But he um, had a family um, event or a, a you know a personal event, and he couldn't make it. So, but he is waiting to talk to us here. And Bob Foster, who in kind of you know I think introduced me to this movie, um, it, it, it's, it's one of your favorite movies, right, Bob? So um, uh, we're gonna I'm just gonna pass the baton to Bob, but, um, and and then uh, we'll bring we'll bring David in. So. Um, here we go. <laughs> uh, let's, let's thank David. Hey, David. Technology works. Can you hear us pretty good? I hear you well. Yes, Bob. We got to turn it down. We got to turn you down a little bit. <laughs> We're going through the same sound that we played the film on, and you are coming through really clear. Okay. okay. Excellent. Okay. Uh, let's. Uh, uh, yeah, can we hear your voice again, David? Yeah, of course. Okay, great. Yeah, right. Okay, right. So, um, you know, to, today we had uh, Hispanic Cultural Day, and uh, we did uh, we had a lot of interesting people in the walkway. We did salsa dancing, which was great, and your film was kind of the conclusion. So we've been up and down and up and down, <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, uh, as Rand said, I've always loved this film, and uh, the first segment just so happens is filmed in, uh, in a sense, our front and backyard. Mm -hmm. uh, that site was the home of Bethlehem Steel, and then it was slated for development, and somehow you found it. And I was just I was wondering how you came to find this location. Okay. okay. Well let me see if there's a, there is an echo. There is an echo. We'll oh, yeah, we're so sorry. Yeah. That's okay. I'll do my best. Um, I wanted, first of all, to, to just to also say I wish I was there today. I had really looked forward to to seeing the film on the, the brick lot where I filmed uh, in 1996 or seven. I filmed that. Uh, that scene, I think in 1996. And I'm also, after three years of COVID, I'm really, I, I just was so excited to see people in person. So having, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't like that I'm sitting here in a hotel room. Uh, the Brickyard, uh, the short story of that is that I was, I was still a student at NYU. Um, Bricks was my thesis film. And uh, I knew that I wanted to, to feature a collective protagonist. I wanted to try and tell a story in which there wasn't a single protagonist, but that it would be a group, like a chorus. And I, I decided to go to the day labor pools in Brooklyn and Queens to begin work. And while I was preparing, I read about, in the New York Times, I read about uh, a Latin American man who was crushed to death when a wall of bricks collapsed on him. And uh, it said that he was a brick scavenger, which I didn't know there were such things. And brick scavengers, I learned, um, take the old bricks, clean them off, and then sell them for contractors who use them for their aesthetic appeal. Uh, and so I needed a brickyard, and I wanted the um, I wanted the scene to have a kind of a, an opera. I don't know. I wanted it to have an epic feeling. I did not want it to feel like this man died in uh, just a small construction site, but I wanted something grand. And I, I looked uh, for about six months. I, I drove to construction sites all over the Northeast. 
And every and time I found no. one that looked good, I was told that no one would insure me. Uh, because by law, when these brick buildings are being brought down, the, a special insurance kicks in and no one is allowed near them. And uh, I, I was going to give up when I found the brick lot where you are. And I spoke to the Italian contractor and I appealed to him. I said that uh, the future of New York City depends on my being able to film right here. <laughs> And it, it was, I mean, I could spend our whole Q&A talking about how challenging it was to work on that site, but um, that's how I found it. Right. Yeah, it's one of those timing is everything because, you know, a little bit earlier, you probably wouldn't get on site and a little bit later it would have been a full scale construction project. So yeah. Uh, I uh, I think I saw the original or one of the New York City screenings, which might have been at Film Forum. Would that be right? It might have been at the Quad. Oh, at the Quad, right, right. And uh, I don't think I knew I'd be seeing Hoboken in that you know first segment. And I remember squeezing my wife's hand, going, you know, that's that's the you know where we're where the museum is going to be. And, Wow. Uh, you know, that it was actually actually just a dream that that's where the museum was going to be. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, you know, just being in Hoboken, we knew that uh, this was, in a sense, uh, an off-site lot. Uh, we had some hopes that we would be here. And I might even be mixing up the chronology. But in a sense, any abandoned property in Hoboken, I would always like to scavenge. Not for bricks, but just mm -hmm. for visual uh, uh, excitement, I guess I would say. So I knew the site well. And as soon as I saw the windows, which, by the way, now are kind of like that was the machine shop. And they had started clearing off a lot of the buildings, as is evidence in your film. And uh, so that's a King supermarket. Uh, what else? We have a Walgreens. We have a museum. It's all a commercial uh, strip and again it was originally a working shipyard and when old-time ship workers still gather uh, do make a site visit here they just can't believe how it's been transformed mm -hmm. um, and you know that's always a little bittersweet uh, in a way but you you would really be surprised so hopefully even go on google maps and just look for 1301 hudson and just sort of see the streetscape um, and uh, I have viewed different segments of this film for different purposes. I used to be involved in teaching film history classes. And if I was looking for a contemporary kind of illustration of neorealism, this would be definitely the go-to. But I hadn't seen all segments in a while. I forgot about the last segment. And uh, that is so powerful when all that noise turns into silence. I mean, mm. that was riveting. And mm. uh, uh, of course, I'm always driven to the first film uh, because of the Hoboken connection. That's just the way I am. Um, I'm going to just ask some questions, comments from our audience. Barbara, you got something? For a minute, I thought there was a connection between the man who was killed in the brickyard and the uncle who never appeared in the second segment. Was that supposed to be the same person? I'm not sure, David, if you heard that. I guess Barbara's saying, are there connections of the people from one segment to the next? I don't think there are, except for, you know, kind of tragic stories, but, but they're yeah. not related. It's, a, it's really an interesting question, though, Barbara, because I, in hindsight, I wish that there were. Uh, and I think had I made the film from the beginning, knowing that I would be making a feature film with four stories, I would have aimed for that. But there is no uh, there is no connection. I, I shot them not in the order that they're in the film. I shot the um, the puppeteer as my first film. And uh, 
And that was my first film at, at NYU. And the film uh, unexpectedly won many awards, including uh, an, a student academy award. And so I was invited to Hollywood for the first time. And I remember uh, going to all these meetings, uh, being taken to all these meetings with the agencies and everybody, it seemed like everybody wanted to make this film with me as a feature film, but they said they just had three changes that had to be made. I had to make it in, I had to make it in color. I had to make it with, with, uh, with real actors and I had to make it uh, in English. And I, I was so, uh, I was really offended and I told them I was going to make it on my own. And it ended up taking me many, many years, but, um, I didn't have a master plan at the beginning, so I thought the one of the time. Um, and the the last story that Bob just mentioned of the the garment workers was the last story I filmed. But you do connect them through everyone uh, in the photo studio. Yes, so that was something I I shot at the very end exactly. Right. Yeah, and just I thought it was a great way to connect them, yeah. and the way you use photographs, letters, uh, things in the room that you know are significant and tell a story, uh, and uh, just the visuals tell the story, and it mm -hmm. just seems so damn authentic. It really mm -hmm. does, uh, which is probably you've heard that before for sure, Victoria. How did he go about deciding on which ethnicities of people he wanted to film? Right. Um, so which ethnicities of people you wanted to film, or was it more of the story itself so that drove which, it? Which and then how and why did he land on those specific ethnicities? So we saw Mexican people, but I was unsure about the others, and why those? Right. Yeah. yeah. That's a really, I didn't hear your name, so I'm sorry, but it's a very, it's a very okay. Victoria. Um, you know, the starting point for the film was that uh, I wanted to to try to express what it feels like to be uprooted in New York City, to be a new immigrant, not someone who's been here uh, for generations. And when I started filming the the city was changing very, very rapidly. So, for example, when I shot the first story in 1992, the Mexican community was very small. It was it was something like maybe 25,000 in New York City in the boroughs. And and then that happened in 1994. And a huge, huge community of Mexicans, mostly from the state of Puebla, began to arrive almost immediately. Um, and so that's one of the reasons that there is a, a story that's set in Puebla. But I, I, I also found this to be, uh, you know, the question of, of ethnicities or of the different countries that were represented. When I was working, on the day labor pools, uh, I learned very quickly. And I, with each of these stories, I spent about a year getting to know people before I began writing. But I would go out to the day labor uh, corners and I learned very quickly that when a car pulls up, men run over from all corners. Uh, and through the eyes of the contractor, they all appear to be the same. They're all uh, immigrant workers. But when the contractor drives off and the men go back to the separate corners, if you spend time with them, you realize that the corners are organized by country. And that on one corner, all the Guatemalan immigrants were standing. On another, it was all the Peruvian immigrants. On a third, the Ecuadorian. And there was a very um, difficult battle between them. 
So, for example, um, the Ecuadorian and the South American uh, immigrants felt that the Guatemalans undercut them because, as they said it, the Guatemalans, if they're deported, they just have to cross over the border. But if we're sent back to Ecuador, we, we almost can never come back. With all these divisions within that uh, within that one corner. Uh, I did not want to preference any of the immigrant communities, but the love story by nature of the story itself required that I set it in a very specific place, which is why um, many people, I, I think, feel like the Mexicans have been given more time in the film. I see. I can so, appreciate that, not wanting to sort of um, give one community too much attention and instead paint a bigger picture of right. the Latino experience in New York and America. Right. Um, that was Francisco and Maria. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Which that when you just pull back and show all the windows and the environment, you just feel your heart sink because you can mm -hmm. see that really happening yeah. and, and the dilemma. You know, you're in a new landscape or a new urban landscape, and you don't have any landmarks from, you know, your town, your church, or whatever it is. And it's just, it's a great moment. And mm -hmm. all throughout the film, when you kind of build up to those type of moments of, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, the uncertainty of someone just coming here, it really is very powerful. Mm -hmm. So, yes, Barbara. I, I was um, very intrigued by the kid in the first segment. I don't know what his age was, and if you didn't use any professional actors, how did you get such a young boy to do what you needed him to do for the plot? Mm. Um, uh, no, uh, I, I just as a, an aside, the the film was re-released for its. Uh, I think 20th anniversary. And a lot of the actors came to see the film at Lincoln Center. It was a special screening. The the girl from the puppeteer came. Her name is Stephanie Rodriguez. And she brought her own daughter, who was the age she was, we filmed. Um, and Antonio, the boy in in the brickyard came with his mother and he's now a man, a grown man. Um, I, you know, we made the film, I would like to say this, we made the film without any money. Essentially, we made the film without money because there was no, no one was interested in financing the film. Uh, and so half of it was shot while I was a student and all of the crew were working from, from the school and then I, I got a grant from PBS, but uh, I did my the casting myself. And in almost every case, um, I knew that I would not be able to find actors to do the work that I needed for the film, that I, I needed to find non-actors uh, who would be invited to express their own feelings in the story. And so with the children, I worked with a school in the South Bronx. I think it was PS 131. It's on 138th Street. And uh, because I got to know the principal of that school, uh, I went back over and over to whenever I needed children. And I cast Antonio and uh, Stephanie from that school. Um, but you asked a different question, I think, as well. How do you get not only children, but how do you get people who have never acted before to to act? So, for example, I don't see any of you, but I see Bob. <laughs> I look at Bob. I've never met Bob, but if I if I thought his face was was what I was looking for, and and the way that he stands express something, I would I would first of all see if I could take him out for a coffee and talk to him about the project. And if, if after 
a few months. Bob said he was really interested in being in the film. I would need to find out very quickly who Bob really is, who Bob truly is as a as a character. No one knows. <laughs> and uh, what what I mean by that is um, those people who know Bob very well know what he's like. He might be um, a very reflective, thoughtful, sensitive. Man. He might be the kind of uh, the clown in the room who makes people laugh. He might be very quick to get angry. I, I don't know. So what I do is I do a casting improvisational set of exercises where um, I can quickly see what people's real personalities are and then um, invite them to audition for those parts, if that makes sense. So with children, it's the same thing. You need to know so much of movies is is um, is the face. You know, it's it's and the eyes. Um, but but you do want to understand if somebody is is very funny or if they're very anxious or uh, what their essential quality is. And with children, it's the same thing. You do games and you can find out how children are. Uh, with children, it's complicated because you're not just casting the child, you're casting the whole family. <laughs> True. You know, if the family, um, I, I, had, I had found another boy to play the role who I loved, but the father was a, had some issues with alcohol. And uh, I realized very quickly that I wouldn't be able to rely on on his family. In the case of Antonio, his mother was, because you're asking a lot. You're asking the family that's already working, in some cases, two jobs, plus cooking, cleaning, and getting their kids ready for school. You're asking them on top of that to, to, to enter into a film, which is a kind of a crazy proposal. Um, and so you really have to have a relationship with the parents as well. Oh, let me say this, because I think this will interest the local audience. Uh, the girl in The Puppeteer, can you picture her? Yeah, the, with the dirty cheeks, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, her cousin is none other than AOC. Wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and the, the puppeteer, uh, her father, is he, he's a professional actor, isn't he? Yes, he, he's one of two actors in the film. And he, right. dear Jose Rabello, a Cuban actor. He's amazing. Yeah. He was amazing. Uh, and, and Jose left Cuba before the revolution. Uh, wanting to be an actor. He had always read about Marlon Brando's studies at the Stella Adler uh, <laughs> school, and he came up and he studied with Stella Adler, but he found that there were no roles for him. He spent a lifetime playing waiters and doormen. Um, and and uh, La Ciudad was the first role that he had that invited him to really... Wow some of that talent is he still with us no no he's not he's not and i kind of remember him being at maybe when the quad showed that film he was there he was there um many nights and and he had not he had not been back to cuba in ever right until until the film went back to cuba for the film festival and we went together and uh, it really changed his life because he started going every year back to Cuba after that, from until he died. He went back every year. Right. I want to get one of his hats. I love his hat. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. Andrea, any? Yeah, I was just curious, um, two questions actually. One is, was there, like a special reason why you chose the order of the four uh, 
vignettes that you chose. And the second question um, is, which one was actually the easiest to film? Wow. <laughs> what a great question. <laughs> um, I, 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 one way to answer it is, I didn't know what order they would be in while I was making them. But uh, I knew after having made uh, Bricks, which is now the opening, that I wanted to make a film uh, about that was really focused about the lives of women immigrants, where, where Bricks was dealing with the lives of, of men who, in many cases, had left their families behind. Uh, and I decided to, to go into the garment district and see if I could begin work with the garment workers. Uh, in, and, I, and I knew that at that point, when I met the women and I began to work with them, that, that I wanted them to be like a bookend to the men in bricks. And that I wanted, I didn't know if it would work, but I wanted the film to open with the death of a migrant whose, whose death is really the, the result of the lack of, of unity and the lack of um, cohesion. And then to see if somehow the women could answer that in their collective action at the end. So that was maybe the only part of the filmmaking where I was consciously uh, structuring one story in in relation to another. Uh, the truth is that I think the easiest one to make, was your question the easiest one or the hardest? Easiest. easiest. I think the easiest was the puppeteer. And, and that's because uh, I was, it was the first time I'd ever made a, a, a non, a, a fictional film. And we shot it in five days with a crew of about six people. Um, everything in that film was really uh, serendipitous. You know, I was looking for a car, for example, which was his home, their home, that was exactly like that. I had old photographs of this kind of car and you wanted them to be able to have their, to sit on the back, fold down and, I couldn't find the car anywhere. I couldn't afford to go and, and buy a car. And and I was in the East Village one day, sort of two weeks before we start shooting, and I saw the car driving past and ran after it. And, and I asked the, the man if he would let me, he loved that car more than he loved anything in the world and whether he would let me use it in the film and i gave him my volkswagen we just changed keys he just gave me the car for two weeks that's so so that was really uh the easiest of the films <laughs> uh, yeah cool uh, let's see lois sure <laughs> not really I, I love it i really love the Okay. Thumbs up from several people. <laughs> Victoria, follow. So does David speak fluent Spanish? I wonder how, what his approach was when he approached these people who are Spanish speaking in, in New York, how that connection was made to begin with. Yeah, great question. So I, I my Spanish now is, I think is very good, but I've now lived in Mexico for many years. Um, but when I started working, I didn't speak Spanish. And uh, I started in the South Bronx. I started working with a <coughs> with an actor, Jose Abella, who plays the father, and the little girl, his daughter, who was Puerto Rican. And we, we worked together in English. Um, and the uh, as I was working on the film, I was being I was. Uh -oh. oh, we froze up. I don't David. know if you can hear us. David, you're frozen. Am I still there? What, you're, you're back. Okay, you're, you're back. back. <laughs> you're back. 
you know, the joke for a while was that I sounded Dominican and then I sounded like I was from Ecuador and then I sounded like I was Mexican. But I really did learn to speak Spanish making the film. The bigger problem was not my lack of Spanish. The bigger problem was just the fact that physically uh, I look to everyone like I'm with the INS. You know, I, I mean, I don't know if I felt to, but I was younger then. <laughs> and uh, I understood in every instance, in every community, that I had to build uh, trust if I was going to make the film. Just to give you an idea what that meant with, with the bricks, uh, the day laborers in bricks, I, I asked a... Uh, a Dominican organizer named Miguel Maldonado, who was trying to organize day laborers in Brooklyn and Queens, if I could come out with him in the mornings. And he would drive out very, he's in the film actually, you see him handing out the leaflets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. I would go out with him uh, very early in the morning. And as he uh, was talking to the men about their conditions of not being paid or exploitation, I wondered what I had to offer hmm. or whether I had anything to offer. And at the end of that first day, I, I had the, I, the big idea that I could make coffee for the men. And I proposed to Miguel that I would buy like an industrial coffee maker on Bowery and I would make coffee. And while he was organizing, I could offer them hot coffee. And so every morning I had to get up at like four in the morning to brew this huge pot of coffee and get it to Miguel's house. And we would go out, and while he was going around organizing, I would just shout out, Café gratis, Café caliente. And the guys would come over and get a coffee and look at me very suspiciously and walk off. <laughs> and I would say, you know, my name is David Riker, and I, I want to make a film about what it's like to be an immigrant in the city. I'd like to know what it's like to be a day laborer, and they would walk away with the coffee. Mm -hmm. But I kept going for six months every day, and eventually some of them, because they were bored, honestly, they decided to like talk to this crazy guy and see who he is. And, and those first meetings would then lead to a lunch together or an invitation to their homes. Um, I spent... I guess six or seven years doing this nonstop so that as I was working, I was also changing. And um, I, I began to really um, understand much more of what their life was actually like. Um, people that I was working with were getting arrested in immigration raids. And so I would start working on their defense or to help them in the in the immigration jails in New Jersey and Elizabeth. I would go visit them in their home countries. Um, but I was constantly aware that I was an outsider trying to tell the story. And that the only way the story could be told is if, um, is if I could earn their trust. Uh, I'll just say for me, I mean, I see myself as like an observant person, but after watching your film, I don't think I looked at the immigrant experience the same way. You really sensitized it mm -hmm. for me. And I can remember certain people in Hoboken that I would meet that I probably just would have been running off, but then I realized what they were about, what they were trying to do. I remember in particular one guy I don't know if anyone would remember this person. I believe it was from Mexico and he would dress impeccably and he would go into the city with a bouquet of paper flowers that he made, very colorful and sell them on 14th street. And I really always got intrigued with this guy. We never talked, I more observed him and I'd buy a flower occasionally, but I was really, uh, a David Riker groupie for a while <laughs> mm -hmm. in terms of really thinking about immigrants and, and uh, 
what that life is like and obviously still think about it. So mm -hmm. again, thanks for making the film. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks for sticking with it. I didn't realize it was such a journey, but why wouldn't it be? Uh, and since you're an outsider, but you're really passionate about it and, you know, you saw it to the end, which is amazing and glad you didn't go color and glad you didn't cast Tom Cruise in there and, you know, the whole bit. <laughs> so just had to say that. So thank you. Gracias. Well, thank you. Thank you. And I wish I could see you all. I can't see the faces, which is very strange, but um, thank you for watching. It's all the dedicated group. <laughs> anyway. So any last questions before we uh, get into uh, dinner mode and all yeah. that? Okay. Yeah. Um, so David, so was this, was Brick released as a short and was in festivals? No, it wasn't because, um, well, it did screen, it did play in a few festivals, but I was quickly then moving to the feature film. And so I didn't have time to release Bricks. Just last year then. Right. Just the puppeteer. So I don't know. I'm just going to take a shot here. Is there a way we could purchase a copy of Brick, like a, a digital type version, and show it in our what we call our media lounge in the back? It would just, I mean, since it's one segment, but it has this strong Hoboken connection, I yeah. think people would really appreciate it. So I'd love to, we can follow up on that. But. Follow up. I if I if I have Brick as a, it wouldn't be a DVD. It would be a uh, you know, it it would be a probably a, a an old standard videotape format. I'm happy to give you a copy to the historical museum. Uh, otherwise, no, it doesn't exist as a standalone. Okay, just one. Yeah, but since it's a segment, you know, it probably could be uh, edited. It so, could be, yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's give an applause, a loud one. <laughs> okay. And uh, signing off, I guess. And yeah. thank you. We've had a great day here. And this was definitely one of the high points. Thank you so much. Thanks, Bob. Thank All you, right. too, David. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Rand, for making it happen. All right. right. Okay. 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 Cool. Thank you.